name is Isaac Lee. I'm a student mechanical engineering here at the University of Utah. Hi everyone, my name is Marco Mason. I'm an undergrad biomedical engineer here at the University of Utah. I'm about to start my master's degree in biomedical engineering. I'm Riley Cram. I'm a computer science student here at the University of Utah. I'm finishing up my senior year right now in the School of Computer. Hi, my name is Fabian. I'm a graduate student in electrical engineering here at the University of Utah. I graduated in 2004 with my undergraduate from BYU, and since uh, since then, I've been working as a project manager and systems designer in renewable energy for the longest time. I originally grew up in northern Germany, near the northern seashore. And uh, people over here ask me all the time, what do you miss most uh, about Germany? And uh, my answer is always the same. The bread, <laughs> <laughs> the yogurt, and the fresh air. Um, so it turns out 7 million people die every year from air pollution. And the World Health Organization estimates that 9 out of 10 people worldwide breathe air every day. According to IQ Air, Salt Lake City, Utah had the second worst air quality worldwide in 2021, only after crossing the Arctic Russia and worse than any other polluted place in the world. You can think of this a couple listed there, Dubai, Santiago, Delhi. We were worse. It's unfortunately not gotten uh, much better since then. You see here an article from 2023, Salt Lake heading into the worst inversion. And uh, the article from the New York Times is a little bit older, but not much. And uh, by the time the New York Times writes about bad air in Utah, you can figure that it's worse here than other places in the United States. Unfortunately, to an extent where, where people here, like it's one of the few places in the world where you can get lung cancer without smoking, like more and more Utahns are uh, hearing. And I hear about it on the radio, people are writing in the newspapers. This is just one example. So this is a thing that, uh, that keeps crawling up on us. Uh, Utah researchers estimate a 10% increase in mortality rate in Utah due to poor air and a host of other health consequences that affects hundreds of thousands of Utahns living here. It's actually cars and trucks that produce most of the smog that we have out there. It's not industry, although that's a significant factor too. But it actually turns out it's very hard to regulate that. It's very unpopular to make uh, a policy that restricts motor vehicle traffic. And part of it is, uh, you've all lived here, most of you for a while, you know the Utahns love their big trucks and their cars, and they buy a lot of them. And the car industry, so those are billions of dollars, just Salt Lake County, right? So the car and truck industry, that's $3 billion per year just in Salt Lake County. This is a huge lobby, and it's really hard for politicians to push against that, against the people and, and against the lobby. Yet, we've talked to a number of city council members, and they keep telling us, well, that's what we get asked at our city council meetings, though. You know, what are you, what are you doing about the air pollution? And uh, they also tell us, we don't, we don't have much to say. So I, I witnessed uh, a, a council here just uh, six months ago. It was mayors along the Wasatch Front, and the only answer that they gave to that question, which most certainly came up, was, oh yeah, everybody will buy an EV, an electric vehicle, and start driving that, and then all the pollution will go away. That is unfortunately simply not true, because uh, to charge the EV, you need to boot up uh, reserve power stations. We're already scratching the bottom here regularly, and, in, in high summer times, uh, putting up all the coal burning and, and oil burning power stations. So that is not a short-term solution. If that will contribute positive in the long run, I can hope so. But right now, that's not the solution yet. That's all they've got for the moment. So in the meantime, something needs to be done to solve this problem. So what we've done is we've developed a, an architecturally appealing um, filter, air filter, that will suck air into itself, clean the air, and then redistribute that air amongst the 
the atmosphere that people breathe. So in this short video, okay, that's nice. So our filters are architecturally appealing. They usually look like houses. They can be adjusted to match the architecture of the area they're in, whether they're placed in a community, around a university, in a business park, or wherever else the customer or municipality would like to place these air filters. They suck the air in through a filtration system and usually, usually using centrifugal pumps and then distribute that air through the roof or through other kinds of <coughs> ventilation systems to then distribute amongst the surrounding area to provide cleaner air for those residents in those areas. Estimates by a private research firm est estimate that the global air purification market will reach 16 billion next year in 2024. Now that's an estimate largely based on consumer retail sales of consumer products. Um, but it shows that there is an extensive interest for air quality, or people who are concerned about air quality and doing what they can. Now these are often, uh, these like retail air purifiers are often indoor designs at smaller scale. But again, the interest is still there. As Fabian mentioned, uh, one of the first groups that we presented this idea to were local government officials in Utah County and surrounding areas, and the response has been overwhelmingly positive. They're interested, they want to pursue this as uh, likely the best solution uh, that they've been presented with so far for air pollution for their constituents. We estimate, because of this, um, we're planning on marketing to our target groups are large cities, school districts, uh, with budgets somewhere in excess of 100 million uh, that both have interest and can afford these devices. This slide shows uh, just in the United States how many K-12 schools there are, cities, uh, universities, which would all represent uh, a portion of that possible market. Uh, this would all lead to a total addressable market in a range of 80 billion with a service attainable market for us here um, along the Wasatch Front of 85 million. And we would start in areas where there are both these groups, but then also air quality is poor enough uh, that it's below, regularly below World Health Organization recommended levels, uh, which drives greater pressure and interest in. So of that um, obtainable market, we predict that we can get about a 5% market over the course of five years. And what that would look like is for us to install the unit as well as for the initial purchase of the unit, we would be asking for a total of $50 million from around 11 units sold, assuming that we sell that unit. On top of that, we'll have a yearly subscription model that allows us to service these units as well as maintain um, the upkeep of the grounds and other architecturally ele architectural elements of the units, giving us a total of around $53.5 million per year based on continual purchase of the units as well as the subscription-based annual service. So how are we gonna get market adoption? Um, the main thing is that we're going to target the key decision makers. Um, in this case, uh, city officials are really the people that we want. Uh, we want people that have decision making power and have the ability to purchase um, this product, um, but are not professional politicians. They, they will um, they'll be able to purchase it, but they're not in a bind with, with, uh, for political reasons. We're also going to target school districts and business parks, um, like Isaac said. These are entities that have um, the purchasing power to do it and also are interested in cleaner, fresher air. Um, we're gonna demonstrate its effectiveness using pilot programs. Uh, we plan to start off in the Wasatch Front, uh, given the poor air quality, uh, but expand after that. Um, 
We plan to collect user testimonials from people that have had positive experiences with this, um, and then highlight our competitive advantages, which I'll go over in a sec. Um, we also are going to expand our operations and educate people on why they need this product. So we're going to target the poor air quality index cities um, like Salt Lake City, and then expand in the United States uh, primarily. Um, but the main the, the main cities that have poor air quality are actually outside of the United States, so we plan to do that within a couple years. Um, we're also going to advocate for supportive policies. And this is actually going to be smoother because of the relationship that we're trying to form with the city officials that have decision-making power. They will be able to support our, our policies that um, allow for these things to be built. Um, and then, obviously, emphasize the long-term cost savings of this. So. Um, it's a one-time purchase, and then with the service fee, um, they have it for as long as they like. Um, this is a product that could potentially last um, decades. So uh, this is the director of the Wasatch Front Regional Council. Um, he says, it's a hot topic now, the bad air quality in our state. Everyone understands how important of an issue it is. Um, we have the momentum to be able to talk about the problems we're facing and answer with decision making. It's harder work, uh, but we're confident that we can find the right solutions. We are the right solutions. Um, so these are some examples of council members um, that we have formed relationships with. Um, Fabian has worked with these people. Um, and then this is just kind of an overview of the main things that set us apart from our competitors. Um, if you'll notice those, those big X, X columns, um, those are for certification. So the, the first one is the National Electric Code. Um, this is basically, some states require this for permanent structures. Um, and then the Underwriters Laboratories, this basically ensures safety and sustainability of our product and equipment obtaining both of these. Um, and you'll notice here, this is for the throughput. Um, our throughput of two, 2 million cubic meters per hour is out of, in a different ballpark than any of the other competitors. And um, there's only one other competitor that has a, a decibel output of as low as us, um, Signer Group, um, but the other ones are significantly higher. And so, boiling this down, um, our product is more discrete, 45 decibels versus an average of 62 decibels for our competitors. Um, we plan to seamlessly integrate with the surroundings, so we're gonna work with um, whoever the entity is to build this structure in a way that doesn't um, obtrude or stand out. We're more sustainable. So we plan on imp implementing a carbon credit system that allows people to get a rebate for um, these, these, this carbon that they're pulling out of the air. Um, and this is basically a, a credit that can be traded. Um, it's, it's not exactly money, but it can be converted to money. Um, we also plan to install solar panels on these, which allows them to be more sustainable. Um, but at currently 16% of Utah's electricity is from renewable sources. Um, the other sources are not as renewable, but um, this would be a net positive. Um, and finally, it's more effective. So you saw on the previous slide, um, we have a 16 times higher throughput than our highest competitor. Question is when you're manufacturing this product, what is the sustainability like on the back end? Because if you reference the electric cars and the manufacturing of electric cars is obviously not good for the environment. What is the manufacturing like for this product behind the scenes? Yeah, so we wouldn't have the similar issues as electric cars because we're not developing batteries for this. It will be powered from the grid. So a lot of those issues come from um, the procurement of materials for the batteries and um, creation of the batteries. So it, it'll, it'll be typical to an, another manufacturing process for a, a, a structure. Okay, and you think that the, the, I guess the throughput of the product would negate any type of like, I guess, out, like negative output or like carbon footprint from the manufacturing? Yeah, our goal would be to be um, net negative with this. It, it wouldn't be worth it. <laughs> okay. So the main advantage comes from the unit actually being able to run off, off with independent energy sources. So uh, it was surprisingly, when we, when we started on this, that was our main focus, to run like to run the fans off 
uh, waste heat from factories, for example, but city council members didn't care about that as well. They, they, that wasn't their concern, you know. Um, and so we, we kind of went in a little different direction. So like the kind units, for example, will be off the shelf. Um, so there's quite a competitive market, so one could try to buy from somebody who's got a greener footprint than someone else, but in the end we'd be stuck with whatever the production footprint there would be. However, once we run it differently, if you drive your electric car, you need to charge it every night, right? And if you're charging that off the grid, that wouldn't be a problem here. So I think over time, uh, we would definitely have a negative footprint. Like, the day it's installed, certainly not. It would take a couple years to recover. Thank you. Uh, is that Um, yes, the unit can filter out carbon just fine. And so uh, it's, it's a certification process you need to go through, so you need to prove it. And, and there's different programs where you can collect carbon credits, and depending on which program you get different money for it, but yes, the unit will be able to, to reduce carbon and, and qualify to some extent at least one. So you guys will be able to like, expand into the uh, carbon capturing uh, market also? It's the plan. So again, there's, uh, there's not just one carbon capture market, there's a number of them. And so depending on who you get certified with, uh, we would qualify for some of those products. Okay. Yeah, last one. Uh, I, I just have a question. Is there a reason that you are not going after corporate entities? Because everything that I see, you, you do a great job at talking about how you're going to address the government. But I feel like if you don't address corporations, you're going to cap out at Utah because you won't build connections in other markets of that air quality. Is that the case, or are you planning to go after these corporate entities? So when you say corporate entities, do you mean like large corporations or yes. small business corporations? Large, large corporations that you can build these structures in multiple locations. So part of our team, our, our main like focus is community. We want to clean communities, we want to clean the air. And so that's why we focus and chosen to start with small municipalities, municipalities and the leaders of those municipalities. So the service obtainable market uh, contains uh, a little over 100 companies that have more than 2,000 employees here in Utah. So we did consider those as customers and they were reflected in the numbers. Uh, we may need to brush up the slides to make sure that those in there are. So they are totally target customers, maybe just not the very initial customers. Uh, two questions about the product. First off, I may have missed it. What's the size looking like? How big is this shed? So, <laughs> so that's the thing, and that's how we can get such a high throughput with our thing is with our device. Is it can be adjusted to business park, a university, a town, multiple throughout the city, and really be tailored to the specific locations it's at to have a larger output with more pumps and more filters in it, or smaller, a small shed that you put in your backyard, or a whole house type of a building. So it will be like a, like the smallest unit, but it will be more like a starter home, about, and it will look like a starter home. And we had a simulation of it looking like that, we just didn't show it, because we're not good enough at it. that going in. A follow-up question to that, though. This is a lack of knowledge on my end. What is 50 decibels relative to? Can I put this in my backyard? Can I sell a portion of my backyard to the state to have them put one of these in there? Yeah, so about like your air your conditioning unit, your condenser on site. So probably about that size of some, uh, some level. So yeah, it wouldn't make any more noise than the AC unit that you have uh, attached to your house already. Uh, sure, um, let's just throw it. Um, cool, uh, uh, okay, let's see. The first one was, what was the ask? What, how much money were you wanting? So this, I, we did not coordinate well yet, but our ask is we're asking for $5 million for a 20% share of the company to fund research and development and construction of one of these initial prototypes to start to work, especially with these interested city council members so that they can, they have a product that they can get behind. Cool. And then one was, what have you thought out, like the downstream of your product? Like, what are you gonna do with the saturated filter, carbon filters? Because once they're saturated, you gotta like, find a way to dispose them. How uh, you thought it through? There's some cool ideas out there. Uh, there is a competitor of ours, Studio Rosegard. They're a Dutch company. They actually back purchase the filters. 
they dump the carbon in the tray, they compress it, and make artwork out of it. And I really? thought that is like just the ultimate thing. It's very interesting. So making diamonds out of air pollution is something I And I thought they're really onto something there. So we'll do, we, we've, uh, we've looked intensively into black protein filters, so we'll make the filters last longer and extracting the smog actually from the filter. And but eventually the filter will be dumped and that's uh, part of the negative footprint that you need to compensate for, right? At some point the filter just won't last anymore and the filter will get old and you need to recycle it somehow. Go ahead. So, do you have numbers on how this would work with the traditional AC unit? Obviously you need to work in tandem, so um, if you're, maybe you're like a boom, that would be a good point that video. You know, just to back that up. Yeah, we won't sell it to you. Like, uh, like a senior unit will, will cost like so. The senior unit will maybe somewhere between around two and a half million dollars. And then, if you wanted to autonomously power it, you're looking at another one and a half to two million dollars. So, a combined fully autonomous unit, four and a half million dollars. It will be the size of your house. You won't get a building from it for your backyard, and you won't be able to afford it as a normal citizen either. So this is like, imagine you're going through a neighborhood, just like house number 10 is actually not a household, it looks like a house, it's actually a filter, and it will cost more than the houses left and right to it. Right. So in places like California where electricity, they're actually not facing some of this stuff because there's so many people using electricity. Um, how, the, how would your unit contribute to electricity use just in the city? Yeah, so we power, so there's a number of uh, good ways to power it, and the way we build it, it will take variable power. That means you could extract power from places that could easily feed into the grid. Take or where I live, we have tons of canals, irrigation canals that run. It's actually fairly hard to harvest that for, for grid power, but it wouldn't be harvest, uh, hard to harvest it for us. Or in city would build it next to one of those canals, and eight months of the year, it could just feed right off that, and, and just not need a grid connection at all. Go ahead. Yeah, um, so I know you mentioned you've talked to uh, local city officials and you're also looking to like, advocate for certain policies about uh, air quality. Um, really, like, how local are we talking? A city and county level. Okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Have you uh, looked into talking to like, anyone on the Utah State, like, any of the congressmen or congresswomen there, or like, the representatives or senators um, on the actual level of DC? We haven't talked, and we think they're not actually the ones interested as much. Um, so the, the citizens are like, so the city council members are in reach of their citizens, very much so, they're very exposed. They're part-time politicians, although they decide over huge budgets, right? But like, so they get almost no money for the work they do, uh, yet they spend uh, hundreds of millions, right? If you have a city like Salt Lake, it's like, you know, the $300 million budget. You have five people who work, you know, as an assistant secretary at the U, and then they're a city council member, and they spend that kind of money. And they have citizens asking them about it all the time. Hey, what are you going to do about this problem here? It's a real problem. You know, my aunt just died of lung cancer. I think that's a real problem. What are you going to do about it? And uh, so that's the kind of question that they that they get, and that's the people we're we're talking to, and they're easily reachable too. You saw on the slide, they just listed their photo, cell phone number, and I've called a number of them. You dial the number, guess what? They pick up. It's right there, man. It's not some secretary. They can't afford a secretary as the council member. They have to pick up the phone themselves, and they do, and they will talk to you. So the first one I, I talked to you was on the car ride. We talked for 10 minutes, and at the end, this was my city council member, my neighbor, yeah, how about you come over next week sometime, and we'll sit in my living room and talk some more. And, and that's the kind of experience you have. If you're trying to get somebody working for Utah Department of something, uh, that seems painful, and how they decide about money to appropriate that all seems like a lot of work or not much. Yeah, but the reason why I asked those is because you have like you have a lot of people on your side, especially you're starting in Los Angeles County. The congressman over that district is District Three. He um, he has like a, he's in charge of the whole conservative caucus. So you have some bad on your side. Last question over there. So. From what I'm gathering is it seems that there isn't a big return on investment for the schools or like universities themselves, and so it seems like it's kind of reliant on uh, laws to be put in place where it's kind of a requirement. So I was wondering, is there any other um, um, incentives or return on investments you can offer the schools or colleges directly so they feel more comfortable with that price? So as a school district, I would need some parent pressure, for example, to be concerned about their children playing in the back of the school because there are hazardous, you know, uh, smog levels out there. So I think that might do the job. 
Uh, the one thing that we maybe didn't do a good job uh, presenting here is the cost. So like, you're looking at maybe $400,000, $500,000 a year that you would pay to maintain a unit like that, including the installation and uh, the ongoing maintenance. That's peanuts for a school district. So Alpine School District, that's where my kids go to school. They have a yearly budget of somewhere around $800 million. Most cities are, like smaller cities, are a little over $100 million. That wasn't a concern. When we talk to people, and they, they do ask, what's it cost, you know? And I'm like, yeah, you know, if you finance it over 20 years, you're looking at 512 million. Uh, it's not, a, not a problem. It's your tax money, right? But like, they don't, they're not so worried about it. So these are actually not huge amounts. So I think a school district that spends, let's say, $40 million in third-party testing at the end of the year just to see how they're doing, maybe isn't so concerned about buying a couple of those units uh, on a financial basis. So a little bit of parent pressure, which one would have to organize, right? But that might do the job. Thank you, everybody.